so um, I'm going to start off with you know kind of the what we are aspect of this. Um, we're going to speak to our data management services overall, sort of our challenges, how we get things done. Um, but inevitably, you have to start off with, well, what are we? Um, so taking the big picture view of um, MIT itself, um, as Howard mentioned, I came from a very small liberal arts school before coming to MIT. Very different, similar challenges. Um, but MIT has, um, uh, you can read the numbers, the, the undergraduate population, and we have a large staff, faculty, research um, community. On the library side, we have roughly 170 staff members in our libraries um, across five libraries on campus, plus the Institute Archives and Special Collections. Um, and we have research level collections in most areas. Um, so our data management services, I'm going to move this little arrow because that's going to bug me the whole time. There we go. Um, so uh, our data management services team is, is uh, composed of seven people. And this does not imply any sort of hierarchy of our team. It's just to fit everybody on there. Um, so we have a program head. That's 100% of the time. You, you all may have seen a job description go out um, in the late fall. We're in the process of filling that position but Howard is our interim uh, person in that role. You have myself um, uh, also sort of on paper 100% on um, research data uh, team. But as you all know, you tend to do a lot of different things in the library world. Um, then we have uh, three different liaisons who are also part of our team. And they uh, have um, about 10 to 20% of their time, in some cases 30%, uh, devoted to our data management services team. And, and Phoebe is, is one of our people. And then we also are lucky enough to have our repository um, manager is also on our team, which has been very beneficial. That's a rather new addition. And um, an application developer analyst. Um, that's her current role. Um, but she's had many roles um, in the libraries and has been a longtime member. Um, so with that, so you may be thinking to yourself, wow, they've got seven people. They, you know, that's incredible. How do you do that? How do you justify that? This did not happen overnight. Um, so this is uh, data management services at MIT libraries has been a long evolving um, thing. And so um, kind of put this, this timeline together to give you some of the so benchmarks of the development in that we've been sort of growing this group for well over a decade. Um, it's a little fuzzy when things started. We're going to go with around 2004, um, long before either one of us were at MIT libraries. Um, so we started doing like ad hoc support. Um, and then uh, we had a, um, a, another group was formed it was, that was included, GIS. Um, and uh, some of you may remember the early days of our uh, websites. Um, that I think it was one of the early ones to come out from a library doing data management uh, type of guidance. Um, held our first data management workshop back in 2009. Um, and then a formal team launched in 2010 called the Research Data Management Team. Um, we love changing names at MIT. I'm sure others can also say that they do that as well, because we changed it in 2012 to the Research Data Services Working Group. Um, and then I came along in 2014. Um, I was the first full-time member of the uh, data services group. Um, and uh, then in uh, 2015, we were rebranded again. We went from a working group to a program, which um, means something in our organization, <laughs> um, a little bit more. Uh, a service point that is a stable and ongoing uh, existing program. Um, and we also uh, transitioned to have a second full-time position, the program head position. Um, and then last year, my position, um, which was a two-year appointment, was made permanent uh, staff position. So they're stuck with me now. Um, so that is, this just kind of gives you an idea. We've been kind of figuring it out just like everyone else in terms of uh, where we're going. Um, 
So uh, what we are not, um, we did mention early days GIS and data management are kind of in the same thing. We are, uh, our GIS services are a sister program under the same umbrella of data and specialized services that Howard actually is the head of. Um, but data management services and GIS services are sort of separate entities. Um, we don't do data reference or collection development support. That's handled by uh, others in the libraries. Um, like probably many of you in the room, we're figuring out what our support will be in the data visualization realm of things. We have a data visualization working group in libraries. I mentioned working group to programs. So we have discussions going on in our library right now about that. Um, we aren't embedded in grants or research projects. Um, and we are certainly not IT or doing any archiving type of work. So that's all the knots. So what do we actually do? Um, we, this is gonna sound familiar to those of you involved in data management services. Um, we uh, assist with uh, our researchers with storing and organizing their research data. You know, that's a very broad, we help throughout the, the research uh, life cycle. Um, and of course, we'd be remiss to, you know, we all sort of are quite familiar with data management plans and the DMP tool. Um, so how do we do this and by what sort of service points do we do this? Um, we'll get a little bit more um, detailed in some of these, um, but we answer direct uh, questions and referrals. Um, either researchers come to us directly or referred from our kind of overall ask us service or other liaisons. Um, we give individual consultations. Um, we also have been doing a fair amount of group uh, consultations, so research groups helping them get set up or kind of shore up their um, uh, workflows. And uh, Phoebe will talk about a little bit about one of those examples. And of course, we also teach classes. Um, uh, we're not going to go too much in depth in that in this presentation, but I can say, you know, we uh, at MIT libraries, we're on kind of a quarterly library instruction cycle where January, our Wintrum session, which is called IAP, which, what does that stand for? It stands for. Thank you. Um, everybody knows this IAP at MIT, and it's when a lot of different departments offer classes, and it's very well attended. So we offer classes um, then and then quarterly. Um, and they range from Data Management 101 to a class on file organization, which tends to be one of our more um, highly attended, because I think it just it's easier for people to identify, uh, that's what I need help on. Um, we also do a class on data storage and sharing, as as well as data management plans and the DMP tool. Um, and in the past, we've offered classes as well on metadata and versioning specifically. And with that. Yeah, so let's break it down. So we answer researcher consultations, right? Um, what does that actually mean? Um, I wondered that when I started doing research data management a few years ago. Um, you know, I'd been a science librarian. I was used to answering reference questions. And then people asked me to start answering data questions. I was like, what? How do we even start? All right, so this is a question that came in. And it may seem familiar to you. I'll just read it. To data management at mit.edu, which is our service address on Wednesday at 8.37 p.m. We are being asked to provide a day management plan for our grant proposal that has been accepted for award negotiations by the DOE. We put together a draft. It's to be submitted by Friday. Uh, it would be very helpful to have your feedback on the draft. Do you think the language looks good? Would you have any suggestions on how to improve it? Okay, great. Uh, we did answer this person. We get back to them. We gave them some feedback, um, and they found it helpful. And we all went on about our day. So how did we do this? Um, well, the first thing that happened is the person who was screening the email address that particular day in August um, um, got this email, and they wrote back to the person. So we have a setup where there's, um, as you saw, seven of us on the team, but three of those people are currently taking turns, four now, actually, are taking turns screening our email service. So we take a month at a time. Christine might cover July, and I'll cover August, and our colleague Courtney will cover September. 
Um, and we, that person is responsible for triaging whatever comes in so that no one has to wonder, oh, who's answering this email? I, I, uh, are you around? I don't know. I'm on vacation. So we take turns um, answering emails. Um, we cover for each other when we are on vacation. Um, so the other, the other thing that happened is that the person who was screening um, answered this question, and they answered it by using some of the resources that we've collected. So um, they looked at our internal documentation. We have a wiki. We have a knowledge base that actually we've collected various useful things, and we'll talk more about in a moment. They looked at that. They looked at the internal documentation in the DMP tool itself. They looked at the DOE um, guidelines. Um, and they used all that to craft their answer, look at this DMP and craft their answer. Um, they also, before they got this, um, or before they um, uh, sent a reply to the patron, sent it out to the larger group and said, look, does anybody else have time to look at this on Thursday morning? Does anyone else have time to look at this and be a second set of eyes on my reply? And someone did. And... Um, and those comments got folded into the reply to the person. So we use all of these tools and systems. We have our contact address is actually a list. So day management at, at mit.edu goes to myself and Christine and all the other people on the team. Um, and so everyone can see the questions as they come in. And we can also answer back to that list and have an internal conversation that way amongst ourselves. Um, we get a lot of referrals from other people. So we get referrals from reference li librarians. We get referrals from service points. Most of our questions either come directly to us or the referrals from a subject librarian. You know, the mechanical engineering librarian gets a reference question from someone and they're like, I need help with my data management plan. She just sends it right on over to us. Um, I talked about the monthly screening. We often pair up. So it's quite common for us to do things uh, together, because day management is hard, right? Like, there's often no one answer. There's often no right answer. And that's something that really struck me coming from a liaison background, a science reference librarian background, is I feel like often our reference questions are somewhat answerable. You know, like, do you have this book is answerable, yes or no? Um, I mean, maybe it's complicated and we can get it in their library alone, but like usually there's an answer, right? Um, day management, rarely the case, right? Uh, we do use the DMP tool a lot. This person did not use the DMP tool to write their DMP, but they could have. And if they had done that, um, and they'd hit the review button in the DMP tool, that would have gone to our team. We've configured that so that we get those emails, and then we, again, look at the thing and send comments back to the person. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have a tool that I find exceptionally helpful, which is on our internal wiki. We have a contact log of everyone who's ever written us, um, what they wrote about, what we what they wanted, what we said, follow up, et cetera. And that's useful because, A, it gives us stats. You know, So when Howard writes his annual report for us, we can say we had this many consults. Um, but also, we can go back and look and um, see if this person's ever contacted us or somebody in this department has ever contacted us. Um, um, and it's just a, it's an internal tracking mechanism because we might shift who's working on any particular project. Okay, so again, back to this email that came in at 9 p.m. The researcher sends it, sometimes they may send it through the liaison, sometimes not, but they, the, that goes on to the day management services team, which is all of us. Whoever is screening that month pulls on all these resources, the knowledge base, the um, institutional repository manager sometimes can come in very handy if we have a question, a technical question like, can we take this data type or, you know, are you able to upload this and this person's time frame? And we draw on each other's expertise and resources. So um, if, you know, there's a question about a biomedical topic, I will call on my colleague who knows that field much better than I do. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. So we get this, get our answers turned around, and that is a fairly basic and uh, um, contained consultation. So, 
Yeah. Okay. So you. Yeah, so, um, so what does this actually equate to? Um, and and what, how frequently are we called upon for these sorts of consults? So 15 to 30 consults a year, that may sound really low. Um, some of these involve anywhere from just one meeting to five months of working together. And we'll um, talk a little bit later about one of those that took um, a, a longer, um, it was kind of a can of worms opening type of situation. Um, and then we do, I mentioned before that we do um, workshops, and so we roughly do about 15 workshops a year. So that doesn't seem like a lot for seven people, right? So what do we do beyond this, right? Um, so we do a lot of projects behind the scenes. Um, not only in preparation for expansion and outreach of our services, but to um, do some cross-training within the libraries and um, provide materials uh, to our external community. So one such thing, um, you know, I mentioned our website um, before. I went on the Internet Archive and found it from back in the day um, to what it currently looks like. Um, and Phoebe also mentioned our knowledge base, which I'll go into a little bit in a second. Um, and then we also, you know, uh, some projects that we've been recently involved with, um, developing our IR procedures for student-generated data. That may seem like a really simple type of sentence, but Phoebe can tell you all about how much fun that was and continues to be. Um, uh, supporting lab archives, so we partnered with our ISNT in, in rolling out uh, our uh, ELN, which um, in this case is Lab Archives. And uh, we've been, in, since, um, actually since before I've uh, joined the team, um, looking into uh, how we can expand our services to, of course, meet our researchers' needs. So interviewing faculty about their data needs was a project that we um, engaged in, and actually Howard can tell you uh, a bit more about that if you're interested. Um, in the last year that has set us up now for something that I will um, mention a little bit later. And then, of course, uh, staying on top of all the requirements uh, that our researchers are going to be called upon. We you know, try to stay as familiar as possible. And then all of the other things that we couldn't fit on the slide, which we may touch on a few of those. Um, so our knowledge base, um, so we have a, we use uh, the Confluence Wiki platform at MIT. Um, and so we developed, it was one of our projects a year and a half ago, maybe, um, was, you know, we had a lot of, uh, with a lot of new people coming onto the team, we were realizing that there were a couple people that had a lot of information in their heads. Um, and so when we wanted to, uh, you know, be able to uh, uh, cross-train and to answer our researchers when they come to us with questions, we don't ha want to have to rely on the one person that just happens to know something. And so we uh, basically developed this uh, knowledge base, which as you can see, it's um, broken up by uh, various categories that probably seem pr familiar, that kind of mapped also to the uh, data life cycle. Um, and this is a living kind of breathing document. I think I used my next one. Yeah, so here's an example of one page on here. We have a template, so they all kind of look uh, the same. Everybody has editing privileges and viewing pri privileges, of course. And um, as you can see, has a lot of information. This obviously is not going to be on our public website because nobody's going to read a lot of text. But it's information that we can then provide to our users. And in some cases, we've included email templates for common questions that we get, or um, we also have questions to ask in a consultation about different topics, um, or it can just be like what resources. And we also point to external resources. So probably a live resource that, sources that you all have put out in the public, we are referencing that in these topics so that we can um, you know, take advantage of what you've provided in answering our researchers. Um, and this, uh, as I said, mentioned, this is a sort of live uh, document. Um, and we're actually currently going through a, a review. We're using it as we have two people that recently joined our team within the last 
nine months. And so we're using the review of the knowledge base um, as sort of part of our training um, and onboarding. So they're currently reviewing all the pages and updating and doing all of that. So we have lots of, I'm a process person. Um, so we, we document all of our uh, review processes. Um, Speaking of process uh, and project management, which is one of my um, default settings, I guess, in my, in my life. Um, so I mentioned we have our, our wiki. We, beyond the knowledge base, we also uh, maintain project pages on our wiki. So really, anybody in the libraries at any time can see where we are in a project. And it includes all of our documentation around our projects. Um, we typically, because we have seven people that we can draw upon, um, but also those seven people, their bandwidth at any given time fluctuates. So we um, have small teams, so we have sub-project teams for particular projects that we're engaging in. Um, and they always, of course, somebody takes lead on it, and then based on member capacity, we have people that say, oh, I'm really interested in this, and I want to you know, take part in it. Um, our portfolio management, we have, uh, you know, our, our team meets on a monthly basis all in one room. Um, we just had a meeting yesterday. And so this is when we'll take stock of projects. Um, and in some cases, if we're running behind, we'll kind of take stock of prioritizing and that sort of thing. But on an ongoing basis, you know, even though we're, if we're not in the same room together, it's not that we're not talking, we're, we're, we're chatting uh, about our projects. Um, and, but we also maintain, um, we utilize the Tableau data visualization software um, for a live, uh, uh, basically Gantt chart. Um, and I have a screenshot here, and I'm happy to share with you um, the live version of it. Um, it's uh, pretty basic, but it gets the job done. And we have, we have projects, we have ongoing things that we're constantly doing, such as screening, writing blog posts for our outreach. We'll talk a little bit about that um, later, as well as um, Oh, teaching and uh, various other things that are kind of what we consider ongoing tasks. And then we have kind of infrastructure building things. Um, and I'm not expecting you to be able to read all of those projects. It's, it, that's not the important part. Um, but in the live thing, you can hover over each one of these, and you get the link to the wiki page associated with it, who's the lead, who else is involved in the project. Um, we also have individual tabs for every person, so you can see what person is working on what projects. And it's a way to kind of measure their bandwidth if suddenly they have five projects they're supposed to be simultaneously working on. Um, I kind of oversee the overall you know, making sure we're not uh, bottlenecking some things. Um, so again, if you're interested, I'm happy to kind of um, show you the, the, the live uh, version of this. But this is a way for us to kind of identify where we're at with projects, but also looking forward, hey, do we want to bring up something from, um, we, we have a three-year broad sort of general plan of projects. Of course, that's going to shift as things happen, but we have projects in the wings that we can pull from. Um, so, oh, so, oh, here's our quote of DMS is hard, um, but she stole my thunder. Um, <laughs> so, uh, keeping up with research data management, I, I think this is a challenge that we all have. I mean, there's, it's an evolving field. Best practices are also um, evolving and maturing. So how does our team as a whole keep up with uh, uh, RDM topics? So first off, you know, we do professional development. This is kind of the no-brainer. We're, we're here. <laughs> we're going to be at RDAP as well. So uh, our road show, we're taking on the road. Um, so, but we also do, uh, this is one of my initial fellow projects, this last thing, the RDM updates, because um, there was a challenge of, there's a lot of listservs out there. There's a lot of blogs. There's a, you know, all of this information is posted in various spots. And we wanted a way to kind of bring that into a central pipeline and, and sort of curate it a little bit. Um, and so I created this uh, biweekly digest of uh, external information. And so I send out an email every two weeks. Um, and I pull from, I, when I created the slide set, it was about 40 plus RSS feeds. This includes listservs. 
Um, and also Twitter, hashtag data libs. You guys are awesome. I pull a lot from that as well. Um, and basically, I use a combination of a couple different tools, dig.com and blogtrotter, for those of you who may be into RSS feeds, and basically funnel it into a um, digest. This is an example from last month, um, where and it has different categories of um, uh, that I kind of make it as skimmable as possible. Usually has the first, you know, couple sentences if it's an, a blog post or an article, and. Um, these guys can tell you if they read it or not. But I find it I'm terribly useful um, for myself because I get to basically spend an hour every week kind of skimming things and seeing what's out there. Um, so that's one way that we uh, have uh, figured out a way to kind of make it a little bit easier as a group as a whole to kind of uh, be able to skim pretty quickly. Yeah, and I will say I find her uh, digest incredibly helpful because, um, look, I don't keep up with any professional uh, reading for any of the topics that I support, and I support a bunch, right? And so it's, and there's a lot that is written about uh, research data management, as you know. So it's super helpful to have have that digest. Um, but I want to switch gears and talk about another consultation. Uh, so this one, Christine and I worked on um, last year, um, and. Um, Unlike the 24-hour turnaround of the first consultation that I talked about, this one took three or four months. And here's how it started. A researcher walked to a reference desk. Like, literally, he came into the library and went to the CERC desk and asked for a librarian and said, I'm in Earth and Physical Sciences, and I'm, I'm just looking for some help with some data. And that got to whoever the librarian on call was, and then she sent it on to us. So we met with this researcher, had an appointment, set up an appointment, went to his office, sat down, said, all right, tell us about your problem. And uh, it turns out that what he had was um, data and models associated with this decade-long earth science modeling project. So um, they uh, are working on a climate model. They're one of the big climate models that people use, I guess. And, um, um, and it's been going on for a very long time. It's a multi-site project. It's out of um, California, out of JPL, and it's here, and it's in Austin, Texas, and they've got researchers all over the place, and tons of people around the world who use this project. And he had just published a paper outlining a new version of this model. Like, they up updated the code, and they published this big paper, and he's like, I've got this code, and I've got the model, the new version, version 4. Uh, what do I do with it? And we were like, uh, you've been working on this multi-million dollar NASA grant for a long time. What do you mean, what do you do with it? And he's like, I need a place to put my stuff. And we said, okay. Um, he, wanted, he wanted a secure place to put his, um, his, his data for the model and his model um, linked to the publication, which explained all about how to use it. And he wanted that place to be accessible to the world because this was a publicly used thing by lots of people. Um, he wanted to get away from ownership models. Like he did not want to be the one maintaining this because they had already had problems with like one of the lead researchers moving institutions and taking out a website and so on. And, um, and he wanted to you know, do all this pretty efficiently and quickly and not spend a ton of time on it, right? Um, we said, okay. <laughs> What we ended up doing was we met with the researcher several times over the course of um, the spring, the start in April, just to understand his data. And thankfully, this person was very patient and very helpful and also very good at explaining what he had. And what he had was um, lots of small files that were the outputs of this model. Lots of small files in many different containers and many different file formats. So like hundreds on hundreds on hundreds of files, like all split out. And they all had to be identified and kept in order because it was like climate on this day in this place, right? And they're geo-identified. And so we talked to him a lot and got him to explain all this stuff. And 
Um, we said, okay, first things first, like I would just document what you just said to us, right? Like I would write it down. And, um, and he did. Um, he wrote these readme files, which this is a screenshot of one of them. They're quite detailed. Um, and we gave him a template for writing those readme files. We said, look, tell us what it is, what format it is, what machines you made it on, what machines you need to read it on, where it is, what it's linked to, where this subset fits in the larger picture, and put in the citation of your paper. Um, and I will say we kind of made that up um, based on some best practices, but we made it up based on what we had heard about his data. Um, so he did all that. It was great. He wrote all these like plain text readme files. And then he said, okay, I need a place to put it. And we looked into various and sundry options. We looked into um, whether there was a NASA specific repository, whether um, you know, we could host it locally. It was a little bit too big for our repository. So we ended up going with a public general data repository. And he liked that because he wanted to be able to upload new versions and um, add to it as, as time went on. Um, like I said, uh, this was a wonderful researcher to work for, and he actually ended up presenting all this work to his colleagues, and we sat in on that meeting um, and got some comments and then, you know, iterated. Um, and we talked to him about his metadata, but the core of it, the core of it was just extracting these descriptions. Um, because, again, this was a very complicated project that largely lived in one person's head. Um, and all of that took most of the summer. Um, and uh, I think it was a successful outcome. He was, he was happy. So when we talk about consultations, um, they could be very short, they could be very long, and we kind of have to factor that into everyone's time budget. I only do this part-time, uh, but there are weeks, of course, when I'm spending more time on data management or less time on data management. You know, in the fall, when orientations start, I tend to spend more time on the other half of my job. Um, but this summer, I ended up spending quite a bit of time on data management, and we're lucky to be flexible in that way. Um, all right, so in both these cases, people came to us. Um, so how do we promote our stuff? We um, promote our service internally to the rest of the library. We've been having regular brown bags for um, like other library staff to come and learn about what we do. Um, and that's important because um, uh, data management services, I'll just jump, jump down, is promoted by the liaisons to their groups. So we have this model where liaisons go out and, you know, meet with their new faculty members and do student orientations and all this stuff. And we um, try and give them talking points so they can talk about our service there. Um, we also, we interact with a lot of different parts of campus and the libraries, so we talk to IT a lot. We talk to the people who do intellectual property a lot. We talk to the Office of Research um, quite a bit. Um, and these are the folks who are doing things like institutional grant submissions and whatnot. Um, and we work quite a bit with our internal scholarly communication troop and our um, kind of a greater uh, campus-wide group as well. We have a website that Christine talked about. Um, we try to keep that as up to date and as useful as possible um, so that people can go there and find out more. Um, we have blog posts that we um, post regularly and we do offer classes. We talked about that. But what we want to do, we know that we could do more outreach, right? Like we know that we could do more promotion and, and community outreach. We would like to do that. Um, we also, I think, on the horizon, would like to do more research into um, complicated topics. So, as we said, day management is difficult um, because there's often no best practice or emerging best practices. Um, so, we want to do more research into and also make public documentation available on things like our file organization classes expand that, or I've been working on a project recently talking about how to archive software as part of the data management uh, process. We don't have great local data storage. Um, we would like to improve it. So uh, that's something that we are actively working on. Um, 
And just within the library, I think there's, this is a continuous process of building relationships with all the other parts of the library. There's a real overlap, for instance, with the archives in things like records management. So the archives has now hired a new records management person. I don't think they've even started yet, but um, when they do, like, we'll have conversations about how we work together. Um, and then a couple big projects that Christine can talk more about. Um, we're uh, working with these various campus partners on developing RDM network, which is sort of an overview look at all the RDM services that exist on campus and trying to knit those together and identify missing areas um, and build out services. Um, and we're also looking at developing, like I said, an internal uh, research data repository, which is something that um, we're certainly getting requests for, you know, from various uh, places, and we want to explore building that. 